Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is uh, Jose Garrido, and I'm um, a researcher at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, and I have the, um, the pleasure to host this session of the nano seminars in, in medicine and health. So um, this seminar, it's a um, joint seminar between the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology and the Nanomedicine Lab at the University of Manchester. And today's seminar um, is going to be about uh, flexible electronics for neural interfaces. And we have a great pleasure to have with us Professor Jonathan Viventi from, uh, um, from Duke University. But before uh, introducing the talk of, of Jonathan Viventi, as you know, in this, uh, in this seminar, we also have a, a talk from a local researcher. And in this case, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Edua Masvidal, who is a, a postdoctoral researcher uh, here in the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology before he has a PhD from the Spanish Center for Microelectronics, the Institute of Microelectronics in Barcelona. And um, um, Eduard Masvidal is an expert on, on graphene sensors for brain interfaces. So he will introduce his presentation and then we'll move back to, uh, to the presentation from Professor Viventi. We are going to have the questions that will be at the end of the, of the, of the complete session and you can use the Q&A or the chat and we will try to read them. Yeah, thank you very much. And Edu, please, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, so let me share the screen. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in the seminar about neural interfaces. So when we talk about neural interfaces, we mainly talk also about the brain and the brain is what allows us to um, interact with the world by processing the information that comes from the senses and also give rise to our coordinated um, abilities and our cognitive abilities. Neural interfaces and then play a role here as when it, they allow to improve our understanding of the brain and also to treat the brain in case of disease or injury. The field of neural interfaces is highly interdisciplinary and it combines um, concepts from electrical engineering also neurobiology and also material sciences. And it's from this perspective that I will focus today. Um, since the, from the many materials that are used for neural interfacing, um, um, there is not an ideal one that can um, fulfill all the requirements of chronic and, and full bandwidth um, neural recording. And in this sense, we have been working on applying graphene for neural interfacing. And why graphene? So graphene has a set of properties that make it highly suitable for neural interfacing. One of those properties is field effect, which allows um, graphene to be highly sensitive to charges. And it is also um, electrochemically stable, and therefore we can use graphene in what is called a solution-gated field effect transistors, in which graphene forms the channel of a transistor, and it is in direct contact with the electrolyte. Um, and it is also biocompatible, so it can only, not only be placed in electrolyte, but also in direct contact with tissue, and therefore um, neural signals in close vicinity to the transistor are converted into current modulations. If we take the transfer curve of this device, we can then convert these current modulations back into, into the acquired signal. We have spent um, several efforts uh, in developing like flexible and microelectrode arrays of graphene transistors and making this um, in a microelectronics compatible way. Our current um, process uses polymide as a substrate and then metals are defined by liftoff and graphene is transferred and patternat and then we encapsulate the devices with a photodefinable layer. And all this, all this is done at wafer scale and after the devices are structured, we can delaminate the, them from the wafer, and we have been focusing on developing um, devices both for um, surface applications and also penetrating applications. So um, in the framework of the graphene flagship, we have been validating this technology also in collaboration with many partners across Europe. No, and we started by um, benchmarking this technology against the state-of-the-art um, platinum and gold electrodes for um, local field potential recording. And here you can see some recordings from the surface of an anesthetized rat. And then we moved to also explore other signals that are not as common as the local field potentials. 
such uh, what is called uh, DC and infraslow signals. We have benchmark graphene transistors against, and again, the um, platinum and gold microelectrodes and observe that for a kind of wave that is called spreading the polarization, that is a DC wave that it has much larger amplitude that it lasts several um, seconds um, until one minute, and graphene transistors perform better than microelectrodes, and they um, have similar um, fidelity than the gold standard of DC copper recording, that is a glass micropipette. However, they overcome the limitation of the micropipette that is um, being single point. So with these devices, we can map the DC potentials across the brain, um, such as splitting the polarization wave and its spatiotemporal dynamics. And we have also checked the biocompatibility of these devices and observed no significant um, microglia activation um, using graphene. And also we have studied um, the chronic use of this technology. And here you can see how the transfer curve and the transconductance, that is the coupling of the signals in these devices, and only um, slightly reduced um, in, during chronic implantation, but this is still enough to observe evoke potentials over the whole duration of the implants. Um, moving to applications, then um, we have studied several applications of the devices, for, but for the sake of time, I will focus only on epilepsy. So here you can see um, two seizures, how they are recorded using um, electrodes and they look quite similar. However, if you um, look at the DC coupled signal as it will be recorded, then they are quite different. You can observe that the, in one case, the baseline is stable with just a, a slight change prior to the seizure. And in the other one, you can see what is called a positive telespin in the polarization. So motivated by these findings, we developed these intracortical arrays of graphene transistors and use it in experiments where we were injecting a chemical convulsion to induce seizures. And in this case, you can see only two channels, the top one and the bottom one in DC couple mode and also filter to observe the local field potentials. And after injection of the chemical convulsion, we can observe seizures that appear and also um, seizures that are followed um, by um, spreading the polarizations only in a subset of channels or in the total of the channels. And, and here the, in the zoom, you can see some highlights of the recorded signals showing the high quality and um, recordings um, obtained with this technology. And we, of course, focus it on the DC capabilities of this technology to record precision DC shifts and precision speeding depolarizations. But we also focus it on the ability of this technology to record higher frequency signals, such as high frequency oscillations that occur in epilepsy. And then we observe that these devices were sensitive enough to record also these small amplitude and high frequency signals. And, and moving to another application of this technology, we also focus it on the preictal DC shifts, as we observe that previous to seizures, some um, change in the baseline potential was occurring. And we map this across the different um, layers of the cortex, observing that the higher amplitude of this precision DC shifts was occurring in the middle of the cortex, and also that these DC shifts were occurring prior and um, seconds prior to the seizures. Therefore, this technology could add a novel biomarker for um, detecting or predicting when seizures will occur, and not, that could be used for algorithms for closed loop applications. And just to finish, I will also to highlight that this technology can also be used for other applications other than epilepsy, such as the study of basic neuroscience, the influence of infraslow activity in basic neuroscience, and also for preclinical research, not only on epilepsy, but also on the role of spreading the polarization of different diseases, such as a stroke or migraine. And also, in, we predict that they could have clinical use in very concrete applications. And therefore, we hope that this technology can advance scientific discovery and treat some patients. And I would like to, to thank all the people, just to finalize, that has contributed to this work, mainly the group of Professor Garrido here at the Instituto Catalá de Nanociencia y Nanotecnology, and the group of Anton Guimeran, Rosa Villa, the Microelectronic Institute of Barcelona, 
and of course all the collaborators and funders and thank you all for your attention thank you very much edu for for the introduction to the to this uh, to the topic of uh, uh, neural interfaces in this particular case uh, focus on graphene um, so now it's a pleasure for me really to introduce to Professor Jonathan uh, Bibenti, who is the main speaker of the session today. Um, um, Jonathan Bibenti is an assistant professor at the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Duke University. Um, he also has appointments uh, with the neurobiology and neurosurgery departments in the same, in the same university. And uh, I mean, Professor Bibenti is a pioneer in the use of flexible electronic for neural interfaces. Um, he's going to explain us uh, his main research work, which is, you will see, is like a exploring flexible electronics, uh, really in the field of uh, neural interfaces. Um, the goal is to, uh, if I understand correctly, to explore the brain to, with uh, recording from the brain of large areas, but also with high precision. And um, he will surely explore, uh, explain how these tools uh, that he's developing can help uh, to the diagnosis of uh, neuro neurology uh, or neurological disorders, uh, but also for doing some basic neuroscience uh, work. So, well, the floor is all yours. And again, it's, uh, I'm very thankful and uh, very happy that you're here with us today. Great, Jose, thank you for, so much for the kind introduction. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation to come to speak to you a little bit about some of the research that's going on in, in my lab. Um, and Edward, that was just fantastic work. I, I'm, I'm excited to see more of that and, and uh, ask you questions offline sometime when we get a chance. But uh, fantastic work you're doing. I love the signal quality from those graphene transistors. The signal to noise looks incredible and the frequency range you're able to capture is, is astounding. So great stuff. So. As was introduced uh, already, I will talk a little bit about some of the trade-offs we face with existing neural interfaces. We can either sample the brain at very low resolution from large areas of the, of the brain using existing clinical tools for preclinical evaluation for uh, epilepsy surgery, or for some research applications, we can cover a very small area of the brain at very high resolution. And the reason we can't have both of these things simultaneously is a fundamental constraint on the number of wires that we can bring out of our neural implants out of someone's head. And this doesn't work very well with the way our brains are structured. We have over 12 million neurons in every square centimeter of cortex. And so our clinical devices are vastly undersampling the activity available. And our research tools are only sampling a very small portion of the cortex. So just to give a little more example of this, you can see the scale of the Utah Array, which is a fantastic tool for research and has enabled uh, incredible studies from the BrainGate trial um, and many other trials. But you can see that we're leaving a lot of information on the table. We're not able to capture the entire motor cortex or the entire speech and mode language areas or, um, or to be able to see the propagation of epileptic activity to better understand how micro signals give rise to seizures in the brain. So why do we need higher resolution, uh, particularly for epilepsy? So some of my colleagues um, implanted arrays of hybrid electrodes that include micros and macro electrodes. The existing clinical standard electrodes are two, two to three millimeters and spaced about 10 millimeters apart. And so they asked the manufacturer to make some custom devices that had little grids of microelectrodes, um, just a four by four grid of electrodes spanning uh, with millimeter spacing. And they recorded from patients undergoing evaluation for epilepsy surgery. And they found things that were extremely interesting. They found events that they are calling micro seizures and these events electrographically look very similar to macro scale seizures, but they're not observed even a millimeter away on adjacent microelectrodes, let alone on the macroelectrodes. So the big question was, what is the relationship between these events and um, large scale electrographic clinical seizures? Are, are these little events happening all the time? Do they increase in frequency prior to seizure onset? Are they spreading across the brain? We don't really know because we can't sample enough of the brain at this resolution to map them um, consistently prior to seizure onset. They also identified other 
uh, signals. This is micro scale uh, periodic epileptiform discharges. And as mentioned, was mentioned a little bit earlier, high frequency oscillations, again, constrained to a small number of electrodes and barely observed even a millimeter away. So what do we need? How are we going to solve this issue? Well, we, we'd like to sample at very high resolution from large areas of the brain. But in order to do that, because we're constrained by the number of wires that we can bring out of someone's head, we need multiplexing. That is, we have to combine the signals from thousands of electrodes down to a much smaller number of wires and ultimately make the entire thing wireless. No, we don't need to have any wires coming out of someone's head. We'd also like our technology to be extremely flexible, to conform to the irregular surfaces of the brain and give us access to previously inaccessible areas of the brain. Now, the challenge of doing this with, with uh, flexible electronics is that we also have to simultaneously make very low noise amplifiers and circuits and multiplexers that consume a very small amount of power and allow us to sample from every electrode on the order of kilo samples per second in order to capture the high frequency activity um, that we observed earlier. So how can we do this? When I started um, my PhD a while ago, we uh, started looking at technologies from, um, from John Rogers group at, the, at previously at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, um, and now has moved to Northwestern. And he had developed a technique for making flexible circuits using conventional silicon, but making these circuits extremely flexible and potentially stretchable by making them very, very thin. So we started working together um, to develop the biomedical applications of this technology. And so the idea with making silicon, even though it's traditionally a rigid and brittle material, you can make it flexible and even stretchable by making it very, very thin. And so the same way a piece of two by four lumber um, is very rigid and a piece of paper is very flexible, they're the same material, but they have dramatically different physical properties because of their dimensions. So if you make silicon very, very thin, then you can bend it and even potentially stretch it. So we started to work together to build, to build up um, biomedical applications of this technology. We made an active electrode array that included buffers, amplifiers, and multiplexers um, using these thin film silicon transistors. And this is an example of the first device we made that was 360 electrodes uh, arranged in a grid that was 20 by 18. And because we were able to combine signals at the source in the electrode array, we need only 39 external wire connections to sample all of the activity from this area. And as a review, you might know this, how, do, how does this work? Well, the idea is that if we want to sample um, combined signals, we can, for example, oh, that's the wrong one, sorry. I lost my, for example, and with a multiplex circuit, we can turn on all of the electrodes in row one and their signals can be read out on shared column lines. And then we can turn off row zero here and turn on row one. And then we're able to sample all of the activity occurring in the electrodes in row one. And if we can do this fast enough, we can cycle through all the channels on the array quick enough to sample every electrode at the 10,000 samples per second. Then we're able to completely reconstruct the original signals that we observe from the brain. Um, and now we only need one wire for every column and one wire for every row on the array, which is a dramatic reduction in, in the number of wires as we scale up to larger and larger array sizes. So techniques that are really common in, in CMOS digital cameras and other image sensors, we've applied to making a kind of image sensor for the brain. And so what did we find? Well, in a one square centimeter of brain, and this is what we typically would record from one single electrode in our clinical tools where you'd get just this waveform. We found in our square centimeter of electrodes, this is now uh, 360 electrodes showing the raw voltage from each of these electrodes slowed down 18 times during an induced seizure. And so we found that in this animal model of, of seizures, we observe complicated spatial dynamics and repetitive spatial patterns occurring on the micro scale over and over again. Uh, and so these patterns kind of inspired us to say, well, are there ways that we could um, better prevent and stop seizures more effectively if we could map out the spatial dynamics of these events occurring across large areas 
brain. So things we weren't able to see before, now we can see. So that was some of our early work, my early work. work. Um, what have we been doing since then? Well, kind of my lab is focused on three main areas. And that is building passive conventional electrode arrays that in, do not include electronics using a new material called liquid crystal polymer uh, for, for some reasons I'll show soon. Uh, and then we've continued to work on our active electrodes to improve the reliability. Our early demonstrations only worked for a few hours or maybe a few days because of the challenges of encapsulating actively powered circuits that have bias voltages on them um, with thin flexible polymer encapsulations that need to survive long term. Um, and then finally, we've worked on recently human translation. So how do we bring electrodes into the operating room and start to move these technologies towards FDA approval so that they can become the standard of care for epilepsy surgery. First, we'll talk about some of the thin film electrodes we have fabricated using um, new materials. We explored the use of liquid crystal polymer, um, which is a new kind of thin film encapsulation material that uh, has some really nice properties when compared to polyimid. We've used polyimid as well, um, which is nice to work with and sort of thin and very flexible. But liquid crystal polymer, when it's assembled correctly, it is the two layers of LCP encapsulation on the bottom and the top. These get fused together under intense heat and pressure. And so rather than relying on adhesion between layers, they actually melt and reflow into a single uniform layer that can't delaminate. So uh, this helps to eliminate some of the common failure modes we've seen of polyimid electrodes, which is eventually water uptake goes through the polymers and causes layers to delaminate, and then all of your conductors are exposed. Um, it also, liquid crystal polymer also has about five times lower water uptake than polyimid. So we think this is a potential inspiring material for chronic, really reliable, implantable electrodes, perhaps on the scale of five, 10 years, maybe longer. Um, and because these devices are processed on a, a flexible printed circuit board manufacturing rather than clean room processing, although we, we do some processing in our clean room, um, we can make these things at very low cost. And so large area panels get processed by our, some of our commercial suppliers and we get hundreds or thousands of devices per run. So how do we test these things? We take our various electrode designs and we soak them in phosphate buffered saline uh, at 60 degrees, and that roughly accelerates our aging by about five times um, faster than real time in the body. We measure impedance, the number of still working electrodes, and then for our active devices, we look at the leakage current or any kind of potential current flowing out of the device and into the brain that would be damaging to the brain of any implant, um, any implanted animal or, or human. And so some of the things we found in some of our polyimid devices is that sometimes they can rapidly delaminate over the course of a few days of soap testing. Sometimes they last hundreds of days before delaminating. Um, but what we found was that the LCP devices looked perfect at the end of 231 days of soap testing. Uh, so roughly equivalent to five years at body temperature. And sort of around 231 days is when our soap testing setup fell apart. And so we <laughs> ended our, our experiment. So we do need to redo this with a better design setup, but the electrodes were still great. So we're excited about that. Now we moved on to testing our LCP electrodes. Um, in my lab, everything can, we test in auditory cortex after it is passed and in vitro experiments, uh, we move everything to the rat auditory cortex. And we use this, we like this area of the brain because we have some really no, well-known neuroscience and some canonical experiments where we can play tones at different frequencies and observe different responses from the brain depending on the tone frequency that we present. And so we can implant these electrodes either acutely or chronically, and we expect to see robust single trial evoked responses uh, with a known topological map of uh, preferred frequency. And then we can do decoding to measure the, the quality of our neural interface. How well can we predict what sound the animal heard as a metric for our, our electrodes still functioning after months or years of implantation? This is a little bit of what the signals look like from an array of uh, 60 electrodes um, acutely implanted in the anesthetized brain. And so each one of these rectangles shows when we present a different tone frequency. 
um, to the animal. And we see different patterns of spatial activity emerging from the voltage signals um, in auditory cortex in response to these tones. And then if we look at what tone most preferentially activates each electrode, we can build a map or a tonotomic map of the gradient of preferred frequencies. So we did this, and then we compared to previously known maps, intracortical maps from serial placements of uh, penetrating electrodes in the same area of auditory cortex. And we have some pretty good agreement uh, between what we obtained from a single trial recording and what we see from um, multi previously published sequential measurements. So this looks promising. We're able to capture known properties of the auditory cortex from our electrodes. We can also train a classifier using machine learning to do prediction. So what after we observed some training data set, how well can we predict on a testing data set um, uh, from 13 different tones, how well can we predict what tone the animal heard? And we can do this with almost 100% accuracy under certain anesthesias from subdural recordings. Um, and our accuracy decreases and drops off in awake recordings and epidural recordings. So we're highly dependent on anesthesia state and, and the type of recording we make. But we can implant our electrodes epidurally over time to assess the signal quality of our electrodes and see if the electrodes survive. And if they fall apart, um, we'd like to know about it. So we implanted five animals for up to a year and we looked at the evoked responses. We see very stable responses over time. We see essentially the same kind of evoked response um, in uh, shortly after implantation as we do over almost a year after implantation. We, all, we look at decoding accuracy or, or our error in decoding in terms of auditory octaves or the tone frequency octaves. We see an initial decrease in, in or initial increase in error or decrease in accuracy in the first few weeks of implantation. Um, could, could be due to scar tissue formation, we don't know. But then we see a very stable implant lasting as long as we can get the animal to keep their head caps on. So up to a year of implantation. Next, we work, worked on scaling up the technology. We wanted to see if we could build larger electrodes using the same kind of manufacturing to be used initially in non-human primates um, and then later in humans. Um, and so we made an array of 244 electrodes that included um, a little bit coarser spacing, 250 micron spacing, and we incorporated holes for simultaneous recording with penetrating electrodes. Um, and a nice property of this manufacturing process is they have already done biocompatibility testing, uh, part of the ISO 10993 standard. We've now since then done additional biocompatibility testing. Um, and so we think the processing, the manufacturer is familiar with making medical devices. So we, we think the translational opportunity for this technology is, is high. We take our microecog arrays and mold them into an artificial dura made out of silicone. And the artificial dura is optically transparent and it allows us to implant our electrodes through a cranial window system um, with our collaborator, Bijan Pesseron, uh, who has just moved to the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and this allows us to test out new electrodes in an animal implant without having to sacrifice an animal for every single device we want to test. And so we can use this cranial access window, we can replace electrodes through this artificial dura, and we can change them out in a matter of a day. If we don't like the way this particular electrode is working, or if we want to record from a different electrode, then we can maintain optical access. We can see the brain underneath our electrodes if we use transparent arrays. Um, and we incorporated, um, designed this chamber system to also include holes and mounting hardware for a micro drive of penetrating electrodes that can be moved down through the array and record simultaneously from in the cortex as well as from hundreds of electrodes on the surface. Now, at the same time, we've worked on improving the reliability of our active electrodes. And what we worked on, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at encapsulation, uh, different materials, 
And eventually what we came up with um, as a way of making our electrodes survive long-term was to move from traditional Faradaic electrodes that directly sense electrical potential from the brain to capacitive sensing. That is, let's cover over our electrodes entirely in an encapsulation material because we found that making holes for the electrodes um, to be exposed enabled a pathway for water to eventually seep into our devices and destroy them. Uh, we just really didn't found, later on we found some potential solutions to make a near hermetic seal through uh, our electrodes. Um, but initially this is a really challenging problem that even thin metals at this scale are still porous to water over long term. And so um, basically any hole we opened up was a potential pathway for failure over the course of weeks or months of, of chronic implantation. And so we developed some, some, some uh, new circuitry to enable capacitive sensing through the dielectric. And for our dielectric material, we explored a bunch of different, uh, many different materials, um, including well-known kind of uh, stack ups of alumina and perylene um, that are currently used on things like the Utah Ray. Um, and even LCP, with, although it's one of my favorite materials for passive electrodes, we found that in our soap tests that pinhole defects in the material would cause them to fail over the course of you know, this extremely accelerated aging test um, at, at higher temperatures. Whereas the thermally grown silicon dioxide that we have leveraged, which is basically glass, it's a uniform defect-free encapsulation, uh, we found it predictably fails um, entirely at once and that it dissolves away slowly over time. We track the dissolution rate, at different temperatures and extract it out how slowly we think this will uh, dissolve once implanted in the body. And we found that there are no pinhole defects that to cause the material to fail and it predictably dissolves away. And so about uh, just under a micron of silicon dioxide we project should last about 60 years when it's chronically implanted. Um, although in some of our in vivo studies we projected slightly lower, maybe the body is more difficult than saline, but at least six years based on our in vivo tests. So, we're thinking this is on the order of potentially a decade or more. We implanted these electrodes in rafts. So an active electrode that included 64 channels arranged in a grid, it's eight by eight, just identical to our passive electrodes in order to validate the technology and compare it to our prior passive electrode implants. And we recorded similar auditory evoked responses from the actively powered and multiplexed arrays. We showed that we can record the same kind of evoked responses, some of our raw data from passive arrays, as well as from our active arrays to the same auditory stimulus. We had the same physical properties of the array. And the goal was to basically show that this, this capacitive sensing can capture the same types of signals as traditional Faradaic sensing. So we recorded the same evoked responses. We achieved similar decoding accuracy um, from, from animals that had implanted, were implanted with active electrodes and passive electrodes sequentially in the same experiment. Um, and our evoked signal to noise ratio was similar, but slightly lower um, because of increased noise from universally fabricated transistors um, built by our collaborator and by John Rogers group. So, we were able to record similar signals, but we have increased noise from these devices. So we'd like to work on improving this. I'll show you how we're addressing this now. We also did chronic implantation. We see similar uh, evoked responses over time um, and, and decoding click evoked signal to noise, uh, signal to noise ratio evoked as signal to noise ratio was just slightly above zero dB for one year. We showed pretty stable recording throughout the duration of the implants. Um, and a, a large, in a reasonable number of animals. We then scaled this up to record from a thousand channels in non-human primates with our collaborator Bijan Pesseron. And the idea here was to be able to record from a large scale multiplexed array with a thousand channels that didn't require a thousand wires. Um, and so this is the same electrode geometry as our 244 channel passive array, only scaled to higher density recording um, using our flexible transistors. So this is showing a visual evoke response uh, in one, one of these animals. 
that was implanted with the active array. We use the same silicon, uh, thermally grown silicon dioxide encapsulation strategy in these devices. And we were, because of we, the incorporation of flexible transistors, we were able to record activity using 92 external wire connections and sample with 250 micron resolution. Now, you might ask well, if we can build active electrodes with arbitrary. Uh, electrode sizing and spacing, what is the optimal size and spaced electrodes that we should be recording from? And so one of my students, Ashley Williams, that has just defended, uh, has looked at um, the effect of contact size on recording signal metrics, neural signal metrics, um, spanning 20 microns up to almost 200 microns. Um, and what we've also looked at the effect of pitch. Do we need to go sample at finer spacing than we are doing now. We've looked all the way down to 100 micron spacing between electrodes. And so from some of the early work, which uh, we'll talk about and we're submitting for publication now, it seems like it really doesn't make all that much difference to have larger or smaller electrodes. In fact, in some cases, the larger electrodes have better signal properties than smaller electrodes, mainly because of lower impedance. Uh, and so we'd like to see, uh, so we, we don't see much reason in surface devices to explore smaller and smaller electrodes, at least for low frequency signals from the brain. In terms of spatial resolution, we looked at how well can we leave out one electrode on the array and predict that electrode from all of its neighbors. And with some bounds, uh, one of my former students, Michael Trumpus, looked at how well can we predict that electrode with less than say 10% error 95% of the time. So some arbitrary bounds we made. And then we explored our data sets from both rats, monkeys, and, and humans. And we found that for gamma band and above, we really require sampling that's just under a millimeter in order to fully reconstruct the electrical potential underneath each of these electrodes. And so it, for low frequency signals, um, including gamma band and high, potentially high frequency activity, we really need the sub millimeter sampling in order to capture everything, um, potentially as low as 400 or 800 microns, but it really depends on the, the signal quality. So if you have higher signal to noise ratio, you don't need to sample quite as finely, but if you have lower signal to noise ratio, you need to sample at higher density to reconstruct everything. Now, if you want to go even finer, if you want to look at recording spikes from the surface of the brain, as Dion Kodahali and others have done, uh, maybe you want smaller electrodes, maybe you don't. We've, we've shown you can record uh, from spikes potentially from 200 micron diameter electrodes. Other people have recorded from 250 micron diameter electrodes. Maybe you want finer pitch, finer spacing for this if you want to capture uh, lots of spiking activity. I think it sort of remains to be seen, sort of very interesting. Um, very interesting, interesting stuff. And so to explore this and to address our issues with noise from university fabricated transistors, we have started to scale up our electrode arrays, our active electrodes, by leveraging commercially fabricated silicon transistors, or CMOS, um, built by a foundry. And so my student Gabby is designing a chip that has 4,000 electrodes on it with 50 micron spacing and integrates amplifiers and multiplexers directly at each electrode and so that we can sample all of these thousands of electrodes using 18 wires, um, but do it in a way that's lower noise and potentially low cost as we can produce wafers in a slightly older process um, with thousands of these chips. And then we're working with Hui Fang at uh, Dartmouth to thin these devices down and integrate them into flexible polymer substrates to make uh, electrode arrays that can have the same form factor as our previous devices, but sample with 64 times higher resolution. Now, maybe you wanna go even higher than this. We're also working with Ken Shepard's group at Columbia to explore an array of electrodes with 65,000 contacts and 25 micron spacing over an eight by eight millimeter area. With the goal of this, this crazy work is from uh, the DARPA NESDI program is ultimately to use CMOS to scale up the number of electrodes that we can record and stimulate potentially to even a million recording contacts with wireless data, wireless power delivery, 
where the entire system is the chip. The idea is that you take your raw silicon and thin it down, and it has everything you need on board, power amplifiers, um, the power receiving coils, the neural uh, analog digital conversion, everything all on one piece of silicon. So to come back to the human translational work, the last piece of things going on in my lab, we have taken our LCP arrays and now scaled them up to other various sizes. We made rat arrays, monkey arrays, and then we've made arrays that are larger for record intraoperative recordings in humans. And so patients that are undergoing uh, epilepsy surgery, implantation of electrodes for deep brain stimulation, or tumor resections that agree to be in our study, uh, we work with our neurosurgery colleagues to, uh, to place these electrodes and recording systems, the custom recording systems that we've built, um, onto the brain in the OR. We sterilize and, uh, the entire recording assembly and electrode as a single module. Um, the electrodes pre-attached, surgeons place the array on the brain, we plug them into our recording system, and we can rapidly set up an experiment in the OR um, in either anesthetized or awake patients. So example of what this looks like, our colleagues from neurosurgery will pull off the protective cap, lower the array onto the brain, leveraging the spring tension of the cables to not apply too much pressure to the brain. And we can make recordings of up to about 20 minutes in the OR. So I work with Greg Kogan in the Department of Neurosurgery. He's a neuroscientist interested in speech and language. And in awake patients, we study things that are uniquely human, like speech. Um, and we try to understand what are the neural correlates of speech activity, and could we use these signals from our high-density arrays to build better speech prosthetic devices for people that are paralyzed or lo have locked-in syndrome or ALS. And so two bits of information, I'll let Greg talk about more of, the, more of this, but two exciting results so far we have found um, are that we see more high gamma power from our microelectrodes. So we have much higher signal to noise ratio from our microECOG electrodes when compared to macroelectrodes or stereo EEG electrodes, the kind of existing clinical standard of care. And we found that if we do a subsampling analysis of our speech decoding accuracy, that really we only achieve even close to our highest possible accuracy or 95% of our maximum with the finest possible pitch on our array, just about one millimeter. And as soon as we drop to two or even three millimeters, we see a dramatic decrease in um, speech decoding accuracy. So potentially we may need to even sample even finer than this to continue to receive higher benefits and, and improvements in decoding. My lab is also interested in epilepsy, it's sort of where we started this whole, whole talk. And so we've looked at micro seizure events from these recordings from patients in the, that are uh, undergoing evaluation for epilepsy surgery. Um, we've seen some interesting micro seizure activity that, that we've just published in Brain Computing Communications and high frequency oscillations. We're about to submit a publication on that now. Um, and interictal discharges. Um, what we've seen so far is that, again, micro seizures are contained to a small number of electrodes and high frequency oscillations also are occurring on a millimeter scale. And so we really need to be sampling the brain at this, this approximate scale to be able to capture these events. Now, these are only recordings in the operating room. How do we get these devices implanted longer term so we can actually make use of them? And so we've started making electrodes that incorporate macroelectrodes and microelectrodes simultaneously. Um, and they're molded into a form factor that's identical to the currently available and currently used tools. And we are working with BlackRock to, uh, and funded by the Brain Initiative to obtain FDA 510K approval for these devices so that they could be implanted. And we're gonna conduct a clinical trial to um, record signals at the micro scale simultaneously with macro electrodes um, covering uh, larger areas of the brain with two millimeter spacing, um, sort of what we can achieve in our first generation of these devices. And what, we've, uh, what we like about these materials is so far they're more flexible, about five to 10 times more flexible than the currently used uh, electrodes are currently used flexible grids that are used for epilepsy surgery. We can also record low frequency signals. Um, we recorded spreading depression, 
uh, from these microarrays in animal models. And we also like that they are extremely flat. Uh, so the existing clinical electrodes have this kind of 200 micron deep uh, well to get down to the electrode contacts. And if, if you've looked at the brain after removing one of these devices, even after being implanted for just a week or two, the brain kind of swells up into these wells. And so we think that probably can't be all that good. We should probably have flatter things that don't have such topography to uh, irritate the brain. And so our surface features are on the order of a, a micron instead of 200 microns um, in the molded LCP arrays. We've used the same manufacturing process to also explore stereo EEG electrodes, our hybrid electrodes that incorporate the existing kind of standard of care macros along with micros arranged around the periphery of the shank of the array. Um, we're just starting to try and use these in the operating room now. Um, the goal is, you know, epilepsy surgery is moving towards more stereo EEG. We'd like to have a solution that can also um, provide higher density recordings for stereo EEG uh, procedures. And then lastly, we are exploring building a wireless version of our arrays for a fully implantable speech prosthetic device. So incorporating a actively powered piece of silicon to do uh, amplification, digitization, and wireless transmission in an electronics module that is molded in LCP, provide a near hermetic package um, to be able to record from a thousand electrodes um, chronically in the brain for at least, at least a few years. And so we're just, just starting on this project now. So to sum up the things we've worked on, um, we're taking passive electrodes from rats um, into monkeys and now into humans. Um, and we're continuing to work on our active electrodes. We'll still need a little bit more in terms of uh, reliability testing and in terms to show that we can actually move these to humans as well. But that's something I'd like to look forward to. Um, we're sampling the brain at, at as close as 50 micron spacing. We'll see what sort of scale we actually need. Uh, we were able to sample at very high sampling rates, and because we can integrate amplifiers and multiplexers at the electrode, we can reduce the number of wires that need to come out of our devices. And ultimately, we'd like to make the, the electrodes fully wireless and apply for FDA approval um, under the 510K pathway um, for the passive devices. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, sponsors for this work, the NIH, the DARPA, uh, DOD, uh, ARO, NSF, and others, the Cure Foundation. Um, and of course, all of the students, uh, PhD students that worked on this, as well as postdocs, research scientists, and our collaborators. Um, with that, I'll stop and ask if there are any questions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jonathan, for this uh, uh, fantastic talk no, on, the, on the potential of this uh, of the integration, hybrid integration of thin films, uh, also showing the CMOS, no, and the wonderful path from the small rodent work and all the efforts you're doing now towards the, the translation. I mean, it's a, it's a marvelous work. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. I, I have a couple of, um, I'm going to open now the session for questions. Uh, you can ask uh, Professor Jonathan Viventi. Of course, you can also ask uh, um, Eduardo Masvidal. There's, I see at least one question on the, uh, in the Q&A and I'm going to read for you for the moment. Um, uh, there are two now. So one is uh, uh, by Jose de la Cruz. Uh, hi, Jonathan. Thank you for the interesting talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so when talking about the different uh, electrode sizes, you said that bigger electrodes record better uh, because of the lower impedance. Mm -hmm. Then I suppose that when you coat the metallic electrodes with the silicon oxide to them to make them capacitive, you also increase the impedance, no? Because, you, well, you have an additional capacitor, right? So could you comment on how much does the impedance increase with the 900 nanometer silicon dioxide layer? And if that uh, inc increase uh, affects the signal quality? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we haven't really looked at signal quality and impedance in the active electrodes. Um, we can't actually even measure the electrode impedance because it's never the electrode's never brought out. It's only, only connected to the gate of the transistor. Um, and so with all of this work at looking at different electrode sizes, we've done with passive electrodes. Um, and there we've tried to reduce the impedance as much as possible. The electrodes are electroplated with platinum black um, to increase their surface area. Um, and so we're trying to 
again, as low as uh, low impedance as possible, but still we find sometimes an increase in signal to uh, an increase in noise from the smallest contacts from 20 micron uh, resonant devices, um, just because we can't get low enough impedance to fully um, get the devices below the no noise floor of the recording system. Mm -hmm. So that sort of also leads to another interesting question I'd like to explore is, are our existing recording systems low enough noise? Um, and is there more information available if we have even lower impedance electrodes and lower noise recording systems? So I mean, we don't know, but it'd be interesting to find out. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's another, uh, another question by Samuel Flaherty. Um, uh, do you lose operate, operating channels pre or post implantation? And are the electrode transistor robust in the housing material, silicone, and so on. Hmm. So in terms of the passive electrodes, um, actually both, yeah, passive and active electrodes, we tend to not lose channels pre and post implantation. Um, we pre-test and you'll see 95% or higher yield. And then after implantation, it's approximately the same. Okay. And the LCP is very durable. Our surgeons seem to handle that and they haven't destroyed anything. Even our, in our collaborators with monkeys, they haven't destroyed anything. The active electrodes using the silicon dioxide encapsulation, uh, they are susceptible to cracking if you bend them to too tight of a bending radius, right? Just mm -hmm. like a glass or a fiber. Uh, they're very flexible and very robust, except if you, bend, if you try to fold them or bend them too tightly, then the material will crack and that completely destroys the device. And so there's no, there's no recovery from that. So you have to be cautious about how tightly you bend them. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's another question also for you from uh, Michal Prokop. Uh, very interesting. Uh, what is the LCP passivation thickness and in comparison to polymide? Uh, mm -hmm. How flexible, conformable are the devices? And what are the processing temperatures for LCP? So yeah thickness uh conformability and uh and temperature processing temperature yeah so right now the thinnest sheet that we can get commercially is 25 microns thick so the total device thickness is about 50 microns with you know micron or two for metal um it is more flexible of a material than polyimid so it's a little bit more conformal than polyimid but we still not as flexible as we probably like it to be. We'd like it to be thinner than that, but it's hard to get. There's no available sheet that's thinner. Oh. Um, you could potentially make your own, go a little bit thinner if you wanted, but manufacturing is a little bit hard. Um, but uh, we think that we've also worked with our neurosurgery colleagues and tested different mechanical uh, samples, and they kind of don't want that much thinner because they like to be able to push the electrode under the dura to reach different locations. And if you give them things that are too flexible, they either will tear it or they'll, you know, crumple it up into a ball. So there's a kind of minimum stiffness uh, that you kind of need to achieve, and the LCP gets us there. And then we have a very th reasonably thin silicon to mold samples together that gives us a little bit of stretchability. Um, and a little bit more handling capability and takes away the sharp edges from, you know, something that's essentially a paper-like material. We don't want paper cuts in the brain, so we mold them in, in silicone. Yep, yep. Last thing, processing temperature. I, yeah, I'd have to check the data sheet. I think it's 350 degrees Fahrenheit, I want to say. It is quite warm, but, yep. um, and some fairly, or it could be PSI and fairly high pressure as well, but it's in the, the material data sheet. Okay, thank you. Another question in the chat. Uh, it's um, it's about the imaging modalities. Whether the the devices are compatible with imaging modalities. Mm -hmm. So we have tested um, uh, MRI compatibility. It seems like the artifacts would be very minimal and would therefore be compatible with MRI. We haven't run any through an MRI with humans. We have only done it with phantoms. We do intraoperative CT scanning with the devices in, play, in place, um, and we are just barely able to see them. That's kind of the challenge is that they're actually too little metal to be able to, to find them sometimes. So we are adding in some of our new designs, larger metal pads on the back of the array. Uh, one, to be able to initially as a reference electrode, and two, to hopefully we can see the things so we know where they end up, especially when we're threading a long, thin strip under the skull and the dura, 
uh, we want to know where it goes. So it's um, it, they're almost too transparent to CT. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Um, uh, another one, <laughs> it's very active, so, uh, Jonathan. Um, so Robert Ho, um, for micro cracks related to the active electrodes coated in silicon oxide, uh, thus the failure comes from the loss of electric contact or absorption of water due to the porosity of the or some of the component components. Yeah, so as soon as the encapsulation layer of silicon dioxide is cracked, then the wiring underneath is exposed and it's powered with a few volts. And that causes sort of instant failure because then the current will flow from that from those power lines into the brain. And so the difference with actively powered arrays of any kind um, is that any single pinhole defect anywhere on the device will cause some current to flow, um, crack or a pinhole, and a tiny amount of current flowing through the uh, power lines into the brain rapidly causes uh, hydrogen and oxygen formation, hydrolysis of water, and then that hole, even if it's a tiny pinhole, tends to get worse over time and very rapidly within the course of hours, um, the device will fail. So. Um, whereas a passive electrode, if you have a pinhole defect over a metal contact or over your traces, it makes no difference at all and no one cares, no one notices. But anything that's powered causes rapid failure if any part of the encapsulation fails. I agree with that. Uh, I actually, I would like to pick up there um, because that's a real limitation of the active devices, right? Uh, they are wonderful in what they can do, and we work with active devices, but certainly the um, there is this challenge of that, you uh, know, that uh, you would, uh, I mean, like a small uh, holes or pinholes would uh, damage uh, completely the device. So what is your, where is your take on that? I mean, what, what, what is, a, is there a way for, for translating the, the technology? Is this a major issue from your discussions that you have with FDA or, or neurosurgeons? Uh, what do you think about that? I think there are solutions. I think, you know, we've, we've seen at least one with silicon dioxide. I think silicon carbide is potentially another solution that could be even more long-term reliable. Um, there may be other ways of solving the encapsulation challenges. Uh, we haven't talked to the FDA about this stuff. It's still kind of too early for active electrodes. Um, we are taking the approach that I kind of showed earlier of let's have active components in a separate module that is rigid and encapsulated by at least 25 microns of LCP and thermally okay. effused. Um, so we're putting our active circuitry initially in a package that is uh, well sealed and solid and sort of uh, well, uh, reasonably well understood. It's obviously not a titanium contain can welded laser welded canister and so it's going to going to still require some long detailed discussions with the FDA mm -hmm. this is a new material and a non hermetic packaging but um, <laughs> we think it, that that will be achievable in in the sort of um, at least medium duration implants and so that's kind of our next step beyond the most immediate approval of totally passive, non-powered LCP arrays through the 510K pathway, we think that will be a shorter, uh, a shorter runway. And then we'll have to do an IDE for, um, uh, for the yeah, wireless agree. device. Yeah. So sorry to be, you know, US centric in terms of standards here. I'm not, not quite, uh, uh, don't quite know the, the European equivalents other than the CE mark, but yeah. Um, and following up on that, um, for the, I mean, it's a fantastic work for the translation. I think that uh, we really need to, um, we really need to push uh, in that direction. And, and I mean, that here in Europe is much more difficult than in the US, you know, I mean, that uh, all this um, translational work that you're doing is much more complicated in, in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to ask from, from your perspective, what is the main challenge that you perceive from the FDA for, translating thin film technologies, right? Thin film technologies, you mentioned that they are considered non-hermetic uh, encapsulation. Uh, we use metals, uh, materials, which are sometimes, uh, there are concerns in the industry like gold, uh, right? Uh, so what, what do you think of, uh, what is the main challenge for thin film that you're finding? I, I don't think there's a big 
challenge in terms of thin film um, passive arrays. Uh, we saw sort of Neuro One uh, yep. already obtained 510K approval. Um, in our early pre-submission inquiries, I think they've been receptive. And uh, I think there's some you know, questions we have to justify about new materials, not using LCP instead of polyimids. But um, yeah, I, I think it's all straightforward for passive devices. I, I, I think the, uh, the challenges will come in with powered electronics and you know, then there's a whole other level of yeah. complexity, but I, I think it's achievable. Um, the totally freestanding, you know, powered thin film encapsulated active electronics will be, you know, yet a third level of, of, of challenge, but you know, we'll get there eventually, I think. I think it's possible. Sure. Um, last question, and that, and that part is like um, you mentioned um, briefly that uh, to increase, sorry, to decrease the impedance of your small electrode, you use platinum black. Is it also something that you're going to bring into the into the clinic to the translation, the platinum black coating, or you are not using that one? Uh, no, yeah. For our translation, we use um, those devices are plated with platinum iridium. Oh, okay. So we work with a company that does that does those devices. So we want that to be uh, something that can be done in volume. Okay. Um, okay. We do the platinum black in house because it's easier, I guess, uh, than platinum mm -hmm. iridium. They don't have the special sauce that uh, yeah. that platinum group coatings are. Um, Epic Medical now does them. Um, okay. Um, okay. I don't see. I don't know if there are any other questions from the audience. Um, let me check uh, again. So there are. There is the Q and A, and there is the chat. Let me check both. Uh, no. Um, I don't see. Um, any other questions? So, well, what I would like just to say again is uh, thank you very much to both of you. First, to the short introduction of Eduard, and um, also by the talk of uh, Professor Viventi. Jonathan, it has been a really pleasure to have you. A uh, wonderful talk again, uh, showing all the efforts early on in your career now, uh, moving into a completely new phase uh, with clinical trials ahead of you. We're following you. Uh, definitely, we will be in contact and uh, we're looking forward to connect again. Yeah? Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. I look forward to seeing more of the graphene work and all of your flexible electronics work. Have a nice trip back from Switzerland. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye, bye everyone.